Section 15 of the Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Meg Triton. The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith. Part 3, Chapter 2b. When every man, even of middling understanding, so readily despises unmerited applause, how it comes to pass that unmerited reproach should often be capable of mortifying so severely, men of the soundest and best judgment may, perhaps, deserve some consideration. Pain, I have already had occasion to observe, is, in almost all cases, a more pungent sensation than the opposite and correspondent pleasure. The one almost always depresses us much more below the ordinary, or what may be called the natural state of our happiness, than the other ever raises us above it. A man of sensibility is apt to be more humiliated by just censure than he is ever elevated by just applause. Unmerited applause a wise man rejects with contempt upon all occasions, but he often feels very severely the injustice of unmerited censure. By suffering himself to be applauded for what he has not performed, by assuming a merit which does not belong to him, he feels that he is guilty of a mean falsehood, and deserves not the admiration, but the contempt, of those very persons who, by mistake, had been led to admire him. It may, perhaps, give him some well-founded pleasure to find that he has been, by many people, thought capable of performing what he did not perform. But though he may be obliged to his friends for their good opinion, he would think himself guilty of the greatest baseness if he did not immediately undeceive them. It gives him little pleasure to look upon himself in the light in which other people actually look upon him, when he is conscious that, if they knew the truth, they would look upon him in a very different light. A weak man, however, is often much delighted with viewing himself in this false and delusive light. He assumes the merit of every laudable action that is ascribed to him, and pretends to that of many which nobody ever thought of ascribing to him. He pretends to have done what he never did, to have written what another wrote, to have invented what another discovered, and is led into all the miserable vices of plagiarism and common lying. But though no man of middling good sense can derive much pleasure from the imputation of a laudable action which he never performed, yet a wise man may suffer great pain from the serious imputation of a crime which he never committed. Nature, in this case, has rendered the pain not only more pungent than the opposite and correspondent pleasure, but she has rendered it so in a much greater than the ordinary degree. A denial rids the man at once of the foolish and ridiculous pleasure, but it will not always rid him of the pain. When he refuses the merit which is ascribed to him, nobody doubts his veracity. It may be doubted when he denies the crime which he is accused of. He is at once enraged at the falsehood of the imputation, and mortified to find that any credit should be given to it. He feels that his character is not sufficient to protect him. He feels that his brethren, far from looking upon him in that light in which he anxiously desires to be viewed by them, think him capable of being guilty of what he is accused of. He knows perfectly that he has not been guilty. He knows perfectly what he has done, but perhaps scarce any man can know perfectly what he himself is capable of doing. What the peculiar constitution of his own mind may or may not admit of is perhaps more or less a matter of doubt to every man. The trust and good opinion of his friends and neighbors tends more than anything to relieve him from this most disagreeable doubt, their distrust and unfavorable opinion to increase it. He may think himself very confident that their unfavorable judgment is wrong, but this confidence can seldom be so great as to hinder that judgment from making some impression upon him, and the greater his sensibility, the greater his delicacy, the greater his worth, in short, this impression is likely to be the greater. The agreement or disagreement, both of the sentiments and judgments of other people with our own, is in all cases, it must be observed, of more or less importance to us, exactly in proportion as we ourselves are more or less uncertain about the propriety of our own sentiments, about the accuracy of our own judgments. 
A man of sensibility may sometimes feel great uneasiness, lest he should have yielded too much even to what may be called an honorable passion, to his just indignation, perhaps, at the injury which may have been done either to himself or to his friend. He is anxiously afraid, lest, meaning only to act with spirit and to do justice, he may, from the too great vehemence of his emotion, have done a real injury to some other person, who, though not innocent, may not have been altogether so guilty as he at first apprehended. The opinion of other people becomes, in this case, of the utmost importance to him. Their approbation is the most healing balsam, their disapprobation the bitterest and most tormenting poison that can be poured into his uneasy mind. When he is perfectly satisfied with every part of his own conduct, the judgment of other people is often of less importance to him. There are some very noble and beautiful arts in which the degree of excellence can be determined only by a certain nicety of taste, of which the decisions, however, appear always, in some measure, uncertain. There are others in which the success admits either of clear demonstration or very satisfactory proof. Among the candidates for excellence in those different arts, the anxiety about the public opinion is always much greater in the former than in the latter. The beauty of poetry is a matter of such nicety that a young beginner can scarce ever be certain that he has attained it. Nothing delights him so much, therefore, as the favorable judgments of his friends and of the public, and nothing mortifies him so severely as the contrary. The one establishes, the other shakes, the good opinion which he is anxious to entertain concerning his own performances. Experience and success may in time give him a little more confidence in his own judgment. He is at all times, however, liable to be most severely mortified by the unfavorable judgments of the public. Racine was so disgusted by the indifferent success of his Phaedra, the finest tragedy, perhaps, that is extant in any language, that, though in the vigor of his life and at the height of his abilities, he resolved to write no more for the stage. That great poet used frequently to tell his son that the most paltry and impertinent criticism had always given him more pain than the highest and justest eulogy had ever given him pleasure. The extreme sensibility of Voltaire to the slightest censure of the same kind is well known to everybody. The Dunciad of Mr. Pope is an everlasting monument of how much the most correct, as well as the most elegant and harmonious of all the English poets, had been hurt by the criticisms of the lowest and most contemptible authors. Gray who joins to the sublimity of Milton the elegance and harmony of Pope, and to whom nothing is wanting to render him, perhaps, the first poet in the English language, but to have written a little more, is said to have been so much hurt by a foolish and impertinent parody of two of his finest odes, that he never afterwards attempted any considerable work. Those men of letters who value themselves upon what is called fine writing and prose, approach somewhat to the sensibility of poets. Mathematicians, on the contrary, who may have the most perfect assurance both of the truth and of the importance of their discoveries, are frequently very indifferent about the reception which they may meet with from the public. The two greatest mathematicians that I have ever had the honor to be known to, and, I believe, the two greatest that have lived in my time, Dr. Robert Simpson of Glasgow and Dr. Matthew Stewart of Edinburgh, never seem to feel even the slightest uneasiness from the neglect with which the ignorance of the public received some of their most valuable works. The great work of Sir Isaac Newton, his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, I have been told, was for several years neglected by the public. The tranquillity of that great man, it is probable, never suffered, upon that account, the interruption of a single quarter of an hour. Natural philosophers, in their independency upon the public opinion, approach nearly to mathematicians, and in their judgments concerning the merit of their own discoveries and observations, enjoy some degree of the same security and tranquillity. The morals of those different classes of men of letters are, perhaps, sometimes somewhat affected by this very great difference in their situation with regard to the public. Mathematicians and natural philosophers, from their independency upon the public opinion, have little temptation to form themselves into factions and cabals, either for the support of their own reputation, or for the depression of that of their rivals. They are almost always men of the most amiable simplicity of manners, 
who live in good harmony with one another, are the friends of one another's reputation, enter into no intrigue in order to secure the public applause, but are pleased when their works are approved of, without being either much vexed or very angry when they are neglected. It is not always the same case with poets, or with those who value themselves upon what is called fine writing. They are very apt to divide themselves into a sort of literary faction, each cabal being often avowedly, and almost always secretly, the mortal enemy of the reputation of every other, and employing all the mean arts of intrigue and solicitation to preoccupy the public opinion in favor of the works of its own members, and against those of its enemies and rivals. In France, Desprio and Racine did not think it below them to set themselves at the head of a literary cabal, in order to depress the reputation, first of Quinault and Perrault, and afterwards of Fontenelle and La Motte, and even Addison did not think it unworthy of his gentle and modest character to set himself at the head of a little cabal of the same kind, in order to keep down the rising reputation of Mr. Pope. Mr. Fontenelle, in writing the lives and characters of the members of the Academy of Sciences, a society of mathematicians and natural philosophers, has frequent opportunities of celebrating the amiable simplicity of their manners, a quality which, he observes, was so universal among them as to be characteristical, rather of that whole class of men of letters, than of any individual Mr. de Lambert, in writing the lives and characters of the members of the French Academy, a society of poets and fine writers, or of those who were supposed to be such, seems not to have had such frequent opportunities of making any remark of this kind, and nowhere pretends to represent this amiable quality as characteristical of that class of men of letters whom he celebrates. Our uncertainty concerning our own merit, and our anxiety to think favorably of it, should together naturally enough make us desirous to know the opinion of other people concerning it to be more than ordinarily elevated when that opinion is favorable, and to be more than ordinarily mortified when it is otherwise. But they should not make us desirous either of obtaining the favorable, or of avoiding the unfavorable opinion, by intrigue and cabal. When a man has bribed all the judges, the most unanimous decision of the court, though it may gain him his lawsuit, cannot give him any assurance that he was in the right and had he carried on his lawsuit merely to satisfy himself that he was in the right, he never would have bribed the judges. But though he wished to find himself in the right, he wished likewise to gain his lawsuit, and therefore he bribed the judges. If praise were of no consequence to us but as a proof of our own praiseworthiness, we should never endeavor to obtain it by unfair means. But though to wise men it is, at least in doubtful cases, of principal consequence upon this account, it is likewise of some consequence upon its own account, and therefore we cannot indeed upon such occasions call them wise men, but men very much above the common level have sometimes attempted both to obtain praise and to avoid blame by very unfair means. Praise and blame express what actually are praiseworthiness and blameworthiness, what naturally ought to be the sentiments of other people with regard to our character and conduct. The love of praise is the desire of obtaining the favorable sentiments of our brethren. The love of praiseworthiness is the desire of rendering ourselves the proper objects of those sentiments. So far those two principles resemble and are akin to one another. The like affinity and resemblance take place between the dread of blame and that of blameworthiness. The man who desires to do, or who actually does, a praiseworthy action, may likewise desire the praise which is due to it, and sometimes perhaps more than is due to it. The two principles are in this case blended together. How far his conduct may have been influenced by the one, and how far by the other, may frequently be unknown even to himself. It must almost always be so to other people. They who are disposed to lessen the merit of his conduct, impute it chiefly or altogether to the mere love of praise, or to what they call mere vanity. They who are disposed to think more favorably of it, impute it chiefly or altogether to the love of praiseworthiness, to the love of what is really honorable and noble in human conduct, to the desire not merely of obtaining, but of deserving the approbation and applause of his brethren. The imagination of the spectator throws it either the one color or the other, according either to his habits or thinking, or to the favor or dislike which he may bear to the person whose conduct he is considering. 
Some splenetic philosophers, in judging of human nature, have done as peevish individuals are apt to do in judging of the conduct of one another, and have imputed to the love of praise, or to what they call vanity, every action which ought to be ascribed to that of praiseworthiness. I shall hereafter have occasion to give an account of some of their systems, and shall not at present stop to examine them. Very few men can be satisfied with their own private consciousness that they have attained those qualities or performed those actions which they admire and think praiseworthy in other people, unless it is, at the same time, generally acknowledged that they possess the one or have performed the other, or, in other words, unless they have actually obtained that praise which they think due both to the one and to the other. In this respect, however, men differ considerably from one another. Some may seem indifferent about the praise when, in their own minds, they are perfectly satisfied that they have attained the praiseworthiness. Others appear much less anxious about the praiseworthiness than about the praise. No man can be completely, or even tolerably, satisfied with having avoided everything blameworthy in his conduct, unless he has likewise avoided the blame or the reproach. A wise man may frequently neglect praise, even when he has best deserved it, but in all matters of serious consequence he will most carefully endeavor so to regulate his conduct as to avoid not only blameworthiness but as much as possible every probable imputation of blame he will never indeed avoid blame by doing anything which he judges blameworthy by omitting any part of his duty or by neglecting any opportunity of doing anything which he judges to be really and greatly praiseworthy but with these modifications he will most anxiously and carefully avoid it. To show much anxiety about praise, even for praiseworthy actions, is seldom a mark of great wisdom, but generally of some degree of weakness. But, in being anxious to avoid the shadow of blame or reproach, there may be no weakness, but frequently the most praiseworthy prudence. Many people, says Cicero, despise glory who are yet most severely mortified by unjust reproach, and that most inconsistently. This inconsistency, however, seems to be founded in the unalterable principles of human nature. The all-wise author of nature has, in this manner, taught man to respect the sentiments and judgments of his brethren, to be more or less pleased when they approve of his conduct, and to be more or less hurt when they disapprove of it. He has made man, if I may say so, the immediate judge of mankind, and has, in this respect, as in many others, created him after his own image, and appointed him his vicegerent upon earth, to superintend the behavior of his brethren. They are taught by nature to acknowledge that power and jurisdiction which has thus been conferred upon him, to be more or less humbled and mortified when they have incurred his censure, and to be more or less elated when they have obtained his applause. But though man has, in this manner, been rendered the immediate judge of mankind, he has been rendered so only in the first instance, and an appeal lies from his sentence to a much higher tribunal, to the tribunal of their own consciences, to that of the supposed impartial and well-informed spectator, to that of the man within the breast, the great judge and arbiter of their conduct. The jurisdictions of those two tribunals are founded upon principles which, though in some respects resembling and akin, are, however, in reality different and distinct. The jurisdiction of the man without is founded altogether in the desire of actual praise, and in the aversion to actual blame. The jurisdiction of the man within is founded altogether in the desire of praiseworthiness, and in the aversion to blameworthiness, in the desire of possessing those qualities and performing those actions which we love and admire in other people and in the dread of possessing those qualities and performing those actions which we hate and despise in other people. If the man without should applaud us, either for actions which we have not performed, or for motives which had no influence upon us, the man within can immediately humble that pride and elevation of mind which such groundless acclamations might otherwise occasion, by telling us that as we know that we do not deserve them, we render ourselves despicable by accepting them. If, on the contrary, the man without should reproach us, either for actions which we never performed, or for motives which had no influence upon those which we may have performed, the man within may immediately correct this false judgment, and assure us that we are by no means the proper objects of that censure which has been so unjustly bestowed upon us. But in this, and in some other cases, the man within seems sometimes, as it were, astonished and confounded by the vehemence and clamor of the man without. 
the violence and loudness with which blame is sometimes poured out upon us seems to stupefy and benumb our natural sense of praiseworthiness and blameworthiness and the judgments of the man within though not perhaps absolutely altered or perverted are however so much shaken in the steadiness and firmness of their decision that their natural effect in securing the tranquillity of the mind is frequently in a great measure destroyed we scarce dare to absolve ourselves when all our brethren appear loudly to condemn us the supposed impartial spectator of our conduct seems to give his opinion in our favor with fear and hesitation when that of all the real spectators when that of all those with whose eyes and from whose station he endeavors to consider it is unanimously and violently against us in such cases this demigod within the breast appears like the demigods of the poets though partly of immortal yet partly too of mortal extraction when his judgments are steadily and firmly directed by the sense of praiseworthiness and blameworthiness he seems to act suitably to his divine extraction but when he suffers himself to be astonished and confounded by the judgments of ignorant and weak man he discovers his connection with mortality and appears to act suitably rather to the human than to the divine part of his origin in such cases the only effectual consolation of humbled and afflicted man lies in an appeal to a still higher tribunal to that of the all-seeing judge of the world whose eye can never be deceived and whose judgments can never be perverted a firm confidence in the unerring rectitude of this great tribunal before which his innocence is in due time to be declared and his virtue to be finally rewarded can alone support him under the weakness and despondency of his own mind under the perturbation and astonishment of the man within the breast whom nature has set up as in this life the great guardian not only of his innocence but of his tranquillity our happiness in this life is thus upon many occasions dependent upon the humble hope and expectation of a life to come a hope and expectation deeply rooted in human nature which can alone support its lofty ideas of its own dignity can alone illumine the dreary prospect of its continually approaching mortality and maintain its cheerfulness under all the heaviest calamities to which from the disorders of this life it may sometimes be exposed that there is a world to come where exact justice will be done to every man where every man will be ranked with those who in the moral and intellectual qualities are really his equals where the owner of those humble talents and virtues which from being depressed by fortune had in this life no opportunity of displaying themselves which were unknown not only to the public but which he himself could scarce be sure that he possessed and for which even the man within the breast could scarce venture to afford him any distinct and clear testimony where that modest silent and unknown merit will be placed upon a level and sometimes above those who in this world had enjoyed the highest reputation and who from the advantage of their situation had been enabled to perform the most splendid and dazzling actions is a doctrine in every respect so venerable so comfortable to the weakness so flattering to the grandeur of human nature that the virtuous man who has the misfortune to doubt of it cannot possibly avoid wishing most earnestly and anxiously to believe it it could never have been exposed to the derision of the scoffer had not the distributions of rewards and punishments which some of its most zealous asserters have taught us was to be made in that world to come been too frequently in direct opposition to all our moral sentiments that the assiduous courtier is often more favored than the faithful and active servant that attendance and adulation are often shorter and surer roads to preferment than merit or service and that a campaign at versailles or st james is often worth two either in germany or flanders is a complaint which we have all heard from many a venerable but discontented old officer but what is considered as the greatest reproach even to the weakness of earthly sovereigns has been ascribed as an act of justice to divine perfection and the duties of devotion the public and private worship of the deity have been represented even by men of virtue and abilities as the sole virtues which can either entitle to reward or exempt from punishment in the life to come they were the virtues perhaps most suitable to their station and in which they themselves chiefly excelled and we are all naturally disposed to overrate the excellencies of our own characters in the discourse which the eloquent and philosophical Massillon pronounced on giving his benediction to the standards of the regiment at Cantonat, there is the following address to the officers. 
What is most deplorable in your situation, gentlemen, is that in a life hard and painful, in which the services and the duties sometimes go beyond the rigor and severity of the most austere cloisters, you suffer always in vain for the life to come, and frequently even for this life. Alas! the solitary monk in his cell, obliged to mortify the flesh and to subject it to the spirit, is supported by the hope of an assured recompense, and by the secret unction of that grace which softens the yoke of the Lord. But you, on the bed of death, can you dare to represent to him your fatigues and the daily hardships of your employment? Can you dare to solicit him for any recompense? And in all the exertions that you have made, in all the violences that you have done to yourselves, what is there that he ought to place to your own account? The best days of your life, however, have been sacrificed to your profession, and ten years' service has more worn out your body than would, perhaps, have done a whole life of repentance and mortification. Alas, my brother, one single day of those sufferings, consecrated by the Lord, would, perhaps, have obtained you an eternal happiness. One single action, painful to nature, and offered up to him, would, perhaps, have secured to you the inheritance of the saints, and you have done all this, and in vain, for this world. To compare, in this manner, the feudal mortifications of a monastery to the ennobling hardships and hazards of war, to suppose that one day or one hour employed in the former should, in the eye of the great judge of the world, have more merit than a whole life spent honorably in the latter, is surely contrary to all our moral sentiments, to all the principles by which nature has taught us to regulate our contempt or admiration. It is this spirit, however, which, while it has reserved the celestial regions for monks and friars, or for those whose conduct and conversation resembled those of monks and friars, has condemned to the infernal all the heroes, all the statesmen and lawgivers, all the poets and philosophers of former ages, all those who have invented, improved, or excelled in the arts which contribute to the subsistence, to the conveniency, or to the ornament of human life, all the great protectors, instructors, and benefactors of mankind, all those to whom our natural sense of praiseworthiness forces us to ascribe the highest merit and most exalted virtue. Can we wonder that so strange an application of this most respectable doctrine should sometimes have exposed it to contempt and derision with those at least who had themselves, perhaps, no great taste or turn for the devout and contemplative virtues? End of section 15